Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I want to thank you for being here. We've got uh, quite a few folks here, members of our staff, and uh, uh, this is a big day, an exciting day for all of us. Uh, first, I do want to point out that perhaps in a perfect world, the Thursday before the Michigan game, maybe we wouldn't be sort of doing this right now, but I hope you understand relative to what the Board of Regent policies are and how agendas work one week prior to October 5th, uh, uh, the agendas are made public. So we thought it might make some sense to just spend some time with you and, and allow you to ask some questions and, and details. So just kind of want to go back from the beginning. I think it was about four or five months into my tenure. It was January of 2022. We sent out a survey. Uh, really important to me. Obviously, we've talked a lot about our fan base, and we've talked about the importance of our fans to the athletic department. And so we sent out a survey that 22,000 people responded to, which in working with some of our partners was really remarkable. They'd done a lot of these types of things. And to get that level of response was, first of all, awesome. But it provided us with an awful lot of information. Um, I think about three or four months after um, we did that survey, we released the results that all of you had and our fans. And so what I want you to know is that as we've gone through this process, in the next year and a half, uh, we created an executive team of businessmen and women leaders across our state to truly really dive into a holistic vision for, for Memorial Stadium. Obviously, we're celebrating 100 years of an iconic stadium. And the question is, what's the next 25, 50, 100 years look like of Memorial Stadium? So I want to point out, and obviously these are all encompassing, there's a lot of detail behind these. So every piece of our thinking, both during the year and a half process with our leadership team, as well as how we move forward, whether it's how we spend construction or contingency dollars, um, these three priorities are going to drive all of our thinking. These are directly a result of what our fans responded. Number one is create a facility that enhances the evolving fan experience. What fans expect in 2023 is perhaps slightly different than what it was uh, 100 years ago. Number two, we need to modernize Memorial Stadium to ensure an infrastructure for the next century. Really, really important. We love the history that has happened in our stadium is pretty remarkable. We need to make sure that while we're here, that we're working on an infrastructure to ensure that it's in place for the next 100 years. And then finally, and this is really important to us, we want to create a facility that has equitable and affordable access to all of our fans. We learned a lot in that survey. And um, we learned that some of our fans across our state uh, viewed that experiencing Husker football was at some levels beyond their financial capability. And so we need to make sure that we've got a stadium that's accessible I think I mentioned publicly that uh, as a result of this process that we found out that between seat licensing fees and ticket costs, we're the fifth most expensive ticket in college football. So we literally went through every seat at Memorial Stadium. We know the revenue that is attached to every single seat within Memorial Stadium. So that's really important. I want to thank our executive team and committee uh, for their hard work. Uh, again, it's been a year and a half. Uh, we've met at least monthly and sometimes more than monthly. Uh, I also want to thank our staff and Husker Athletics. As you can imagine, uh, this has taken a lot of time and effort on my part. And so having the type of team we have um, that can um, fulfill their responsibilities and help run the department has been really, really meaningful to me. So you probably know most of this, but this is a $450 million project. Uh, one of the things that was really important to me was that we had one chance to do this. If we're going to do this right, we're going to do it entirely. So a holistic vision, not just a South Stadium vision, not just East or West, but uh, important for me. And so I think what you'll see on that second uh, easel there is, um, and these are rendering, obviously, as we move forward, there can be slight alterations, but really important to us that we had a 360 concourse. We really need to have our entire stadium connected. And then the benefit here is we actually can have a, a 270 degree connection on the second level. So obviously, South Stadium, a, a significant focus of what we're going to do here, but every part of the stadium, east and west and north, will also be impacted uh, for our fan experience. We really view the South Stadium as an opportunity to really rethink things. I also want to point out that um, none of this, as you look at the next easel, none of what we're thinking relative to Memorial Stadium modernization would be possible if we didn't have the Go Big project come online. So we have 315,000 square feet of the Go Big project. And again, I always want to thank our donors for making that happen. But as a result of that programming, leaving West Stadium and North Stadium, that's what really allowed us to rethink 
how do we activate Memorial Stadium more than just seven Saturdays of fall? And so what you're seeing across the country as over 100 years, as campus kind of grows into the athletics footprint, you're seeing and looking at ways to activate Memorial Stadium more than seven Saturdays of fall. And so you'll see, and there'll be a lot more detail as we work through this. Obviously, this is part of the approval process. We don't have approval yet from the Board of Regents, and that's what we're seeking on October 5th. But we really look at this as an opportunity to do a number of things. Um, number one is to really integrate academic programming. So we did three things as an executive team. Number one, we went out to Wisconsin. and grateful for our partners out there. They had done a, an end zone stadium. We thought we could learn some stuff there. We went to Notre Dame, who had done a lot of academic programming within their stadium. And then finally, we went and visited the Cubs. And uh, we spent some time with uh, the Ricketts family and the Cubs leadership um, to see how they took an iconic brand, modernized it, found new revenue streams, and uh, created a, an incredible fan experience for all of their fans. So we envision, uh, and we worked with uh, Kathy Ankerson, the Senior Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs on our campus, and she worked with all the deans, and we identified 120,000 square feet on the east side that's going to be available for academic programming. Uh, right now, I think they've identified about 60,000 square feet of need, uh, so there'll be some flex space for them. This won't replace classrooms, but it may be some experiential learning type opportunities for students and some growth there. Uh, South Stadium, really passionate about this, and this is really driven by a lot of our donors, a significant desire and interest to really embrace our students. Um, it's really, really important. Our students are going to be our donors. They're our alumni. They're our future business leaders. And I think the athletic department uh, can do a better job of making the student experience, as, long as, the, as well as the band, uh, a much more integral part of what our game day environment looks and feels like. Yeah, and so a real focus there. We look at community engagement, and some of this is still, you know, sort of yet to be determined, and, but one of the things that I think we can do a much better job, um, and I learned this in my prior uh, experience in Omaha, is the importance of, of using assets that you currently have um, to impact the greater good. So how can we use some of our assets and facilities that maybe have a broader impact than just our student athletes, maybe it's our undergraduate population, uh, community, local high schools. Some of that is a little bit undefined as well as some of it, but um, will be really important that we have that opportunity. And then obviously on the north side, that's still the home of, of Husker Athletics and some evolving opportunities within the medical space. I think you all have recently probably recognized or heard that we've um, partnered with UNMC and, and Nebraska Medicine and uh, really passionate about making sure that our student athletes have the highest level of medical care possible. So that's sort of the vision. It's $450 million, um, $225 million uh, we hope to raise privately. Uh, the athletic department will participate in $100 million. Uh, so we have about $50 million that's at the University of Nebraska Foundation in surplus funds, essentially donor funds. Um, and actually, those are the dollars that we're going to use first. So part of the approval from the board is actually three different components, one of which is about a $45 million initial infrastructure package, which will allow us to get started immediately. Um, and nothing that maybe the average fan is even going to see. It's back-of-house mechanical stuff that we need to kind of put in place before major construction happens. We will then uh, uh, seek to use the central lending program through Varner Hall and uh, borrow another $50 million, just for a little context. We did borrow $50 million for the Go Big project, and um, through the support of our fans and others, we have a very aggressive payment plan, and so that debt will be um, expired at the end of this fiscal year. So we will not start uh, another project and add debt to the athletic department until our previous debt uh, has been uh, extinguished, so really important there. The other $125 million, we're working through several sources to figure out how in a true private-public partnership we can impact, and uh, so we'll be examining those areas as well. Finally, before we do questions, just, you know, general timelines. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the initial infrastructure package, we can get started immediately, given approval and hopeful approval on the 5th, and then ultimately the major construction and, quite frankly, the major disruption that's going to be a real challenge. Uh, is directly after the 24 season, so roughly January of 25, um, you know, we will demolish South Stadium and uh, rebuild it. And um, obviously the hope is to have one season of disruption, and so the goal is by August of 26 
that South Stadium is, is rebuilt in a way that's uh, indicative of the quality of the rest of the stadium. But we need to be honest with ourselves. We live in Lincoln, Nebraska, and um, it's very hard to um, you know, predict the weather. Uh, also, we've had some challenges in, in construction, as you all know, relative to um, supply um, chain issues and those types of things. So I'll also just uh, say that you know, we're, we're going to dive into additional details. Again, we have one opportunity to do this. We're going to rethink everything about Memorial Stadium, and uh, we're going to be willing to do the tough stuff. And I would just ask our fans um, to um, give us a little grace. It is physically not possible uh, to be responsive to 22,000 of our fans on a survey to modernize our stadium in a way that doesn't cause some pain and disruption for our fans. And so I would just ask them to uh, uh, be patient with us and, uh, and try to focus on what the future looks like. Um, but we need to just be honest about the, re the reality that um, this is going to disrupt a lot of people. We've looked at a lot of different ways to try to limit, you know, that disruption, but obviously we're playing football games. And so you've got a whole football season that you can't uh, engage in construction. So we're excited about it. Obviously, there's been a lot of changes in college athletics. Uh, what started out for me is a very simple modernization plan based on amenities relative to fans' expectation has very quickly changed into a business strategy for the next 25 to 50 years. Uh, we're very proud in this athletic department uh, that we do not receive state pack taxpayer dollars or student fees to fund our annual operations. The other thing that we're very proud of is that through the uh, success of Memorial Stadium and our fan base, we have a long history of investing in women's athletics. 92,000 people don't show up at Memorial Stadium to support volleyball if there wasn't a previous history under previous leadership of having a broad-based successful athletic department. So for us, this vision is about ensuring that we have those revenues, find new creative entrepreneurial revenue streams that for the next 25, 50 years ensures that we do not become a burden on our campus, taxpayers, and student fees, and that we can continue to invest in our women's athletics program so we can be as competitive as we've been for the last 10 to 15 years. So with that, I'll stop rambling and, and uh, allow uh, whatever questions you might have. Well, I think, you know, the, the initial assessment was um, it, having it not connected to east and west and, and trying to create the concourse and the connection, um, you know, at, at some point it just becomes more feasible and economically viable to start over. Um, you know, uh, I know our partners looked hard at, at that renovation. Um, you know, can we find a way to just renovate it within so we don't disrupt some of our fans? Um, but the, uh, the decision was made. And, and again, you know, part of what we want to do is we, w we really want to connect east and west all the way up high. So you're really creating a true bowl. There's a competitive component to this as well. You know, as we think about the band down in south and all the student section, you know, uh, our goal is we want this to be the best place to watch a college football game. And so there's more than just the stadium itself. We've got work to do outside the stadium. But at the end of the day, for me, um, what do we do to make this the greatest environment? It also allows you then, Amy, to think about some different diversification in different types of seating. So right now we have club seats and we have suites. And what we've seen and learned is there's lots of different you know, ideas and options. There's ledge seating, there's loge boxes, there's some diversity in, in how we look at that. But more importantly as well, as I mentioned, you know, equitable and affordable, we have got to solve our ADA problem in Memorial Stadium. It has not been addressed and it isn't right. And so part of this strategy is, again, to deal with those sensitive areas that have not been addressed. And by starting over in South Stadium, ADA is a very significant component of that. So what we'd love to do, and again, I want to be very careful here. Number one, we don't have approval. We're confident. Number two, um, as we get into the details, some of the manifest and all that might look different. But the goal is we'd really like to have chair backs, if possible, east and west and south. North Stadium is going to be a challenge, and we don't think we can get chair backs in North Stadium because of the tread depth. We don't believe by code we'd be allowed to get that done. But that would give us some, still some opportunity to view those seats differently. Um, you know, our objective and goal is, is to have 8,000 seats that don't require any seat licensing fee. 
And so we need to find a way to, to make it more intuitive for our fans at various levels and uh, have amenities that match, um, you know, what that investment looks like. What are the challenges of a stadium receipt and, and just the grandfathering of the ticket prices that yeah. you have? And, and how do you kind of make this all work when you take out nine to 11,000 seats? It's a great question, Sean. You know, it's, uh, uh, we're going to have the courage to address all of it. And um, there's going to be strong opinions uh, on all of this. And at the end of the day, I think really what we're charged with, and I, that's why I've, I've always loved assembling people a lot smarter than I am uh, to help hold us accountable. This is not Trev or the athletic department unilaterally making these decisions. We're going to have good, smart men and women, business leaders who are going to help us think through the, this. Um, but the only way to create some of that equity be is to, to, to examine some of that. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to, there's no definitive answers yet on what we plan to do. But absolutely, we intend to take a hard look at the, at the grandfathered clause and how that impacts the rest of our fans. The reality is, is if you look at putting in the modern amenities that our fans would like, the physical structure of Memorial Stadium remains the same, but you're going to have a 10 to 12 percent reduction in capacity just based on, you know, widening aisles, putting handrails, doing the things from ADA and other things that I think a, a stadium in 2023 uh, really demands. I was going to ask about the capacity. You see that in like the high 70,000s when it's all said and done, or what are you thinking? Well, I, I don't want to say a number that I get held accountable to, and everybody, you said, uh, I've learned that. Uh, but, you know, I, I, would, I would envision, you know, based on um, it's going to be in the mid-70,000 range, you know, uh, plus or minus somewhere in there. Um, so I can also tell you that this is not an effort to try to decrease supply, increase demand, and, you know, use, uh, you know, a, a decrease in supply to – um, increase ticket prices to force new revenue. That, that's not really what this vision is about. This is vision is about the amenities, uh, and those are the ones that ultimately drive that 10 to 12 percent reduction. That reduction, the larger reduction when the South Stadium is demolished, only impacts, to be clear, the 2025 season? Um, or if we're... That is our goal, Mitch. Yeah. So the goal is, by August of 26, um, the reason why I say it's a goal is if it, did anybody else built a house in their life, and remember when you're told it's going to be available in October and then you move in in May? Um, <laughs> so w it's the same issue here. Um, obviously, we're, we're gonna, we have the best and brightest that are working on this, and the goal is the summer of 26, we're ready to go, uh, at least in the seating. Maybe there's some back-of-house stuff in South not done, but I think there's some creative ways. But I just don't want to create an expectation of our fans that we can't deliver on. So I am personally, in my mind, preparing myself for two seasons. And I'm going to have ask our staff to think that way, but that's not our goal. Our goal is one year of disruption. Would you the capacity of the stadium being in 25 um, if, if, in fact, it's just 25? And what, else, what, might, you, what might you look at creatively to um, address some of the concerns there? Yeah, so that's what uh, some of the people in the back of the room's job is going to be. Uh, they're much more creative and smarter than I am. But, yeah, if, if it got done prior to the 26th season, that, that's back to that 10 to 12% reduction overall that would be contemplated. So, again, these are, just, these are just broad numbers, but I think it helps perspective. Like today, let's say there's 22,500 people that are seated in South Stadium. When it's done, if you have, you know, ADA and wider and you have chair backs, you're going to get 18,000 people back in. So the physical structure is the same, right? But based on the modernization, the comfort levels that our fans desire, uh, there, there's no alternative other than that reduction. Is there a temporary plan for what you're going to do with the massive student section that's there right now? In for 25? Yeah. yeah. That all look like? We don't have that plan finished. Um, again, this is part of the... Um, the disruption and, and our team has, you know, started thinking about what could we do that while um, <laughs> is not going to placate everybody could be a, um, hey, let's let's do this in the short term and, and maybe even, but I don't want to get into that yet because we don't have any, first of all, we don't have approval. Secondly, we don't have that detailed thinking, but I assure you we will, we will do what we can to um, make whole and make right our students and those affected in South Stadium. And, and there will be those affected in all parts of the stadium. This is not just a South Stadium issue. The reality is um, um, almost everybody could be in, impacted. How many new luxury suites are going to be added to the stadium? 
Not sure. Um, we are uh, looking at additional suites uh, in South Stadium. Uh, I guess I mentioned some of the more diversity. Uh, you know, I think we can, I think some of the trends are, you know, and again, I, I don't want to say we're doing this. These are the things we're thinking about. Some of the trends nationally are premium seating closer to the field, right? Um, again, uh, you, you can, your mind can wander quickly. We've got a, a training table that exists today with a kitchen that we won't need anymore as it goes over to go big, but do we use that to rethink a new club lounge that has field level access? I'm not sure, but these are the types of opportunities that go big is presenting to us now, Sean. So we're going to look at, you know, there's also a trend of, of suites that aren't as big, you know, uh, a lot of our suite holders have said, Hey, it's hard to find 28 people to get them to go to every game. You know, what if we had the same amenities in a smaller? So we're going to look at diversifying some of these, pre, you know, premium areas uh, that, uh, again, meet market demand. We do think there's market demand. We have a waiting list in our suites. Um, so we do have a, a, a waiting list in some of the premium areas. Um, but this is not a vision and a strategy uh, for those premium spaces. Um, it's Adding those premium spaces creates additional revenue streams that will help us offset some of the debt we need to take out and to pay for some of, of the improvements for the rest of the stadium. You mentioned uh, fan comfort, especially when it comes to South Stadium. What's your message to those fans who have you know, kind of been uncomfortable for 20 years when it comes to especially bathroom and concessions? Well, we're sorry. Um, um, I'm not sure what else to say. Um, our son, when he was younger, um, went to a game in South Stadium, and he still said he has PTSD from that experience. He's now 25. But I tell you, it's just, you know, to me, um, I watch our fans. You know, so much of this to me is things like whether they're escalators or additional elevators. I mean, we need to make it more intuitive and easier for Husker fans to support their team. And I look at the effort that some of our fans put in to get here every Saturday, and it is really remarkable. And we can never take that for granted. And so... Um, you know, I, I don't know how to respond to that, Adam, other than to say how incredibly grateful that we are for sticking with us. We know that there's an issue there. Um, how great would it be that people coming from the Haymarket can walk into South Stadium, and if they sit in the North Stadium, they have a concourse that connects? You know, there's just some basic fundamental things. I think there's some security things as we move forward that will be important here that we're going to try to uh, assess. So. Um, I just hope the basic message is, is that across the board, um, you know, we're, we're going to try to dive into every possible detail. I also want to say we're not going to be perfect. Um, and, um, but they will never be, uh, there'll be mistakes. They will never be, you know, uh, a coordinated effort uh, to alienate any of our fans. Do you anticipate um, reduce, sorry, <clears throat> you anticipate reducing the amount of student tickets that are sold? Uh, because now you're going to have less seats in South Stadium, you're going to put students... No, that, that, that's not the effort. Okay. Um, uh, and, and, and frankly, I, I don't know where that's going. We have not had that type of conversation. Um, I will tell you that uh, very early on... So we've, you know, we've pressure tested this. We, we wouldn't announce this if we didn't think we had support in, in the private community. But um, a very consistent message from our donors was how important to them embracing the student experience at Memorial Stadium was. I mean, so we're, we're you know, I mentioned uh, Kathy Ankerson. I mean, part of what we really want to think about is, you know, as prospective students and undergraduate helping in enrollment, how do we activate athletic department resources to help our campus, you know? And so as students and their families are walking across campus, what if they ended up at Memorial Stadium? And this is your home as a student, you know? So those are the types of things that, you know, we want to do. We want to embrace the band. We want their experience to be, uh, uh, you know, as good as our student athletes' experience is. Quite frankly, we have not, um, in my personal opinion, we, we have not. We need to raise the bar in that area. About comfort. So, just for people who are maybe trying to envision what they can expect with like the seatbacks, you maybe updates the East Stadium, that balcony. Area. Yeah. Is that similar to what you're kind of thinking? Would there be different changes, especially for people who are tall? I yeah. Think that's a big question. Well, and that's so, so there's been a lot of technology around. You think back even 20 years ago, if you put a chair back in, you had about two options. And there's been a lot of engineering and, and progress and innovation around chairbacks. And so part of that challenge will be, you know, East Balcony. What we can't do, so, so here's part of the, the stadium that in East and West it was built 100 years ago. 
the architecture and the engineering around that doesn't allow us, unless we tore it all out and re-poured all the concrete, we're not going to be able to change those types of things. There's a, there's a load that it can handle. So you're going to have to be creative in what types of chair back. So, you know, we, we would make them as comfortable as possible, but you're going to get in there what you can get in there based on what, you know, those east and west sides can handle from a load perspective, on an engineering perspective, and what physically is allowed based on the tread depth. So the amount of money it would have cost to, to literally rake the whole east and west and start over uh, would be cost prohibitive. You mentioned the students. With them moving down closer in South Stadium, what, what do you anticipate from a competitive perspective that can do, maybe to affect some games and affect some? Homes? Well, I remember 1993, Glenn Mason, when he was the Kansas coach, trying to stop the game, telling the officials that he we can't hear. You need to tell the fans to be uh, a little more quiet. Um, wouldn't that be wonderful again? Uh, so we've kind of gone away from that in college football, obviously, with the silent count and all those types of things. But, uh, again, I just think um, so much of the stadium experience, from my perspective, whether it's a football stadium or a hockey arena, the students drive the energy. And so why wouldn't we embrace our students to help us drive the energy in the stadium and let them do it in a way that's, you know, um, you're not going to want to put premium spaces right below the band and the students, right? So you got to think through how you do it so that they can be students, enjoy themselves, and uh, the rest. Uh, so we just we need to meet our fans where they are, right? We, we have fans that say, um, if, if we have fans that say, listen, I want my car valeted, um, we need to meet our fans where they are. So we'll think through all that kind of stuff. With the uh, first phase of construction that would begin next year have any kind of impact on the fan experience, seating capacity, anything for the 24? No. The goal is to not have any disruption for the 24 season. And again, I, Mitch, I, <laughs> I've learned, um, please, please give me a little grace here. If something, you know, one of, the, one of the challenges in a project like this is we don't know what we don't know, right? We don't know what's under South Stadium. We don't know what we could find. I know when they built Go Big, this was prior to my arrival, I think there was some soil issues, you know, there, there was things that you don't know when you start. So the hardest part is, is um, you know, really clearly communicating this, this, and this will happen. Here's the details. Because as we dive into this, now one thing I think we do feel good about, and I give a lot of credit to previous leadership here, is, you know, a lot of the mechanical things you're worried about. Oh, my gosh, this is a 100-year-old stadium. Do we have hundreds of millions of dollars of... And we don't think that's the case. Obviously, there's upgrades needed, um, but we think some of the major mechanical stuff that's part of a stadium like this is actually in pretty good shape. But Wi-Fi is not in very good shape. Point of sale is not in very good shape. Uh, numbers of point of sale for our folks. Um, you know, there's just some basic modernization things that I think that can take place that will change the experience. I mean, you know, I've heard from some fans that you know, they would love to go get a hamburger, maybe get a Pepsi. But they're not going to leave their seat because they're afraid they're going to miss half the first quarter to go get a hamburger. I mean, that's on us. So there's a lot of innovative um, advances in technology relative to concessions. We're going to be working with a lot of those types of partners to, uh, again, make that experience. And we can learn from a lot of people. Uh, that's, that's the goal. So you said you went to Wrigley, Wisconsin, Notre Dame. What for fans that are now kind of trying to understand what is maybe the norm for big programs that are starting to utilize football stadiums or baseball stadiums differently? Um, and what did you see that maybe impressed you most? Maybe that you have an eye on from those visits? Yeah, so we, you know, we, we strategically go to each place for a reason. So we went to Wisconsin because it had done an end zone project, and so they had some different types of seating, they had a deck, they had so that was that. We went to Notre Dame on purpose to look at the academic integration. And uh, I'm just telling you, like, there's campus rec involved there. They have the School of Music there, I think anthropology. But there's cafes and Starbucks. I mean, when you walk in Notre Dame's football stadium in the middle of the day, there's, there's just whole kinds of students in there. I mean, it's almost like a student union. Um, so I'm not sure that ours will look exactly the same, but it's like, hey, you know, um, you have this incredible asset. Why, why aren't we rethinking it? And then the Cubs was more about how do you take an iconic brand that's tired, and I would say, you know, and, and rethink it and do it while you're still trying to play. Uh, and then, of course, the Cubs have done, Wrigleyville, they've done things outside the stadium that have looked for additional revenue. 
Um, but they, they, you know, th they have uh, had a very detailed approach to really looking at what the fans want. So they have certain fans that are, these are our die-hard baseball folks. Like, they're going to come, and they're doing, you know, taking all the, and then this is our fun group. They really don't care about baseball. They're just here to have a good time. Well, you have to, you have to meet your fans. And so I'm not suggesting we're going to go as far as all of them, but we've always found that by looking at what some others have done, we can see some trends. But what's exciting to me is having the stadium activated more than just seven Saturdays of fall. I think it is, um, our state is really proud of our stadium. And so, you know, every fourth grader in the state of Nebraska tours Memorial Stadium. And to see their faces, you know, um, I think we should expand on that. Uh, I think we should get more people involved. I think we should think about other unique inventory that can be a part of beyond, beyond football. And, uh, you know, we like Volleyball Day in Nebraska and like Garth Brooks and those types of things. So that's, that's the thinking. Right now, Trevor, right now, my aunt Margaret and my uncle Tom who have tickets in the South Stadium are probably freaking out. And I'm aware. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, how will they be notified, you know, and, and what yeah. should they be looking for? You know? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. And um, obviously we, we can't get ahead of ourselves. This is part of the chicken or the egg deal here, right? So we don't have a project yet. Um, so we can't officially sign pledge agreements with donors until you have approval from the board. Well, you know, the board's interested in, you know, do you have funding? So this is a first step in a process to move forward. But we're well aware of, of how important internal and external communication strategies are going to be. We've talked about um, doing our best to, you know, and, and we're working on some strategies. I'm not ready to, you know, to communicate that today. Uh, but it will be our hope that every single person, in the stadiums, voice will be heard, good, bad, or ugly, and I'm prepared for all of it. Um, but part of it will be helping them to understand what the future could look like, and if that's not the seat today, what's a different seat look like? Um, so whether it's town hall meetings, whether it's, you know, this is not just a Lincoln thing or Omaha, this is a state of Nebraska and even beyond. So we're going to have to be really buttoned up on our communication strategy, and, and that'll be on me. And there will be times when we fall short of that, and we'll apologize and, and uh, work harder. Um, is the plan to blow up South Stadium, implode it, demolish it? Like what's the plan? Well, um, I don't have exact details, but um, you know, it needs to come down. So what is the, the best way for it to come down? I, I wasn't here, but I heard they did a similar thing with Harper, Shram, Smith. Is that, or I'm sorry. Did we just implode <laughs> dorms, <laughs> dorms that our people are living in? I'm sorry. I lived in Abel Hall. That's all I knew. Uh, 903 Abel Hall. But um, so we'll, we'll find out from our partners. But, I, yeah, I would anticipate, you know, because part of that is going to be the sooner we can get it down after the season, the quicker we can start to rebuild. So I don't know if prior to it actually going down, if there's some things that we can do underneath there in terms of underground. Can we start some things? while it's still up so that when it does come down, we can more quickly go vertical with construction? Uh, that's a good question, but that's why we, you know, would be working with experts in this area, so. Could you, I saw a tweet that you casually threw out there that you could do potentially something fun with that. Do you have some ideas for ways that you could activate the implosion of South Stadium? You know, we have lots of people who are really creative. They have lots of ideas in our department. So um, as my wife tells me, sometimes we can't use all your ideas, Trev. But we'll, um, yeah, well, you know what? This, again, this is, we can have a little fun along the way. And um, so we'll, we'll see, you know. But if you're, if you're volunteering to make a donation to get, be the person who gets to push the button, you know, maybe we can, we can talk. Uh, but no, not to not to um, to downplay the significance and the disruption. Um, I want to be very clear that I I understand completely the angst and the uh, frustration that many, some or many of our fans are going to have, and I can only apologize and ask them to be patient with us as we, because again, we've got a hundred year old stadium that we need to ensure is viable for the next hundred years. What, what do you mean in the, terms the of yard section? You know. Well, you know, clearly when South Stadium is gone, that's going to be a disruption. Again, that's why I said it's not just going to be, you know, 
folks sitting in South Stadiums, the students will be impacted as well. I don't know to what extent. And that's why, obviously, our focus is going to be let's do everything we possibly can to have this completed and only have one year of disruption. Um, but there's no doubt about it. There, there is going to be, you know, uh, fewer students likely, at least for one season, that are going to be able to, to have access to Oscar football games. And so, again, there's strategies around that with lottery and other things and how can we kind of – our team has been thinking about that. Um, but that's going to be a real um, – a, a reality that, that all of our students and our fans are going to face. Anything else? Thank you for being here. It'll be a lot more exciting when Coach Rule comes. He'll talk to you about Michigan. Thank you, guys.